So uh, welcome to the guests. Guys, uh, we wanted to do this for three weeks and on the, on the last day of, uh, last night of camp, we want to take half an hour and do it. One of the things that we sometimes overlook is that we've got all this knowledge and, and we, we, have, we do have some seminars, we do have some speakers and, and uh, those are full value and something that we really believe in. We started in the last two years to do it and we've had some amazing presentations, okay? Uh, sometimes we just assume that it's really easy for you guys to talk to coaches. And just like talking to your parents, or talking to teachers at school, or talking to your own coach on your own team, some people are easier than others. Some of you are more comfortable to talk to an adult. You, know, you think, hey, geez, what do I say? What if I sound stupid? I've got all these questions. Um, so what I hope is, is that in the next half hour, um, each person here is going to give a brief presentation. They represent Junior B, Junior A, uh, Provincial Team, Western Hockey League in different ways and different experiences. You're going to get a cross-section of ideas. You're going to get a chance after to ask some questions. I'll lead with some questions that might generate some thoughts for you. It's meant to be fairly informal in terms of you understanding a little bit more about each league, what these guys think it takes to play there, some things about life in that league, okay, in their opinion, okay, and we chose four opinionated guys, so thanks, first of all, we're introducing some, on the far side of the table, Ed Swatsky, he's uh, took a uh, long time head coach of the Yorkton Terriers, took them to the Royal Bank Cup of the Saskatchewan Junior League, uh, really well respected as a guy that would take a team um, and really get the most out of them every year. So that model, that Saskatchewan Junior, what's that league all about? What's it take to play in a place like that? He's coached Team Saskatchewan under 16 and taken them into uh, most national competitions. I'll touch on those experiences in a second. Next name is Grant Armstrong. Grant said, um, what doesn't he do? He's the head coach of the North Delta Junior B team in the Pacific International Junior League in the Lower Mainland of Greater Vancouver. Okay, took that team over late last year, first full year into it. Uh, he's the head scout for the Portland Winterhawks and Western Hockey League. We'll ask him some scouting questions. He runs a, a North Van Minor Hockey, director of operations, and has run coaching <laughs> clinics in BC for about 15 years. Um, so a lot of coaches have come through Grant's to go. So Grant, thanks for being here. Uh, Jeff Grimwood is currently an assistant coach with Paul River, league finalist in the BC Hockey League. Okay, before that, won championships with Peninsula of the Vancouver Island Junior B League. So he's won at every level. He's now moved up a level. He can talk about all those things. One of the real bright up and coming coaches in the BC Hockey League, and many of you have talked to him this week. He's been at our camp for a number of years. Um, Kevin uh, Hasselberg spent the last two years in the BC Hockey League. Before that was with Old Alberta Junior. Um, and uh, has connections to Junior B and uh, Junior A Hockey outside of BC. What's that Alberta League look like? What's the difference? Junior B to Junior A, what's it take? What have they found? Those kind of things. So starting with Eddie, we're just going to give you a few minutes just to present your experiences and then we'll follow up with some questions. So as I'm talking, if you think of a question, try to keep it in your mind, and when they're all done, we'll fire some out these guys, okay? Eddie, go ahead. Hey guys, uh, thanks for having me here tonight. For me, uh, personally, uh, from a hockey background as a player, I played Junior A. Well, I've, actually, I first started with uh, AAA Midget, which you call now, so I have experience playing at that level. Um, went on to play Junior A. I received an NCAA scholarship to Colorado College. From there, I uh, got an invitation uh, to the East Coast League, played there, uh, got up to the American League for a little while, uh, so I had a little bit of experience there. Then obviously, uh, at that time, made a decision, I had a European offer, so I went over and I played 10 years over in Germany. So 
to have some sort of international. I know what it's all about over there, and I know you got a seminar on heritage or ancestry, which uh, might be useful some of, for some of you guys in the future. Uh, from there, got into junior A coaching as an assistant. I had had uh, job then in Yorkton. Um, went had some success, won some league championship, went to national event, the RB Royal Bank Cup in uh, Mississauga. Lost uh, Burnaby, which you guys are familiar with, Carl Turris' team. Uh, they gave us a good licking in the final there on national TV. But uh, I had that. From there, um, had some opportunities with uh, SAS Hockey, uh, SHA, which is similar to BC Hockey. Got in, first got involved with development type clinics, which, which Grant and uh, Mike and, and uh, <coughs> Nate are so fond of uh, uh, out here into some skill development. It's got to be a bit of a passion for me with skill development. From that, I was given the opportunity to coach uh, the under-16 team. They started uh, a tournament. Uh, some of you might be trying out for those teams. It's called the Western Hockey Challenge, right? We first had it in, uh, it was by Airdrie, Alberta, for the Narbor one from that. From that experience, we played against uh, Alberta in the final of that. Um, or actually, no, we didn't make it to the final. We played BC. From that, uh, Canada Games, you guys know about Canada Winter Games. Obviously, uh, it was a big thrill for me last year to coach Team Saskatchewan. It was in Halifax. Uh, it's a team of 16-year-olds uh, that went there. A great experience. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, came short, lost to Quebec, but we got to play on TSN Live, and it was pretty cool for our, for our players. So that's a little bit about that. Uh, I'm not sure where we're taking the Q&A, but uh, I've got to know some of you guys on the ice, and, and like I said, my real passion is helping kids now, especially more directed towards skill development. And I'm not tagged to any one team right now. This year I'm going to help out, I don't know if you guys remember, former uh, tough guy Jeff Rogers. He's going to coach a AAA team in my hometown, New York. I'm going to help him out with some skill stuff. Probably like a far off Lance Saskatchewan, except for Jeff that's up in the corner. I know he plays right in the heart of it in Nipawin in the Saskatchewan League. He's a guy you could ask questions to for sure, but that's kind of a little bit of my background. Hey, thanks, All right. Hey, thanks for having me this week. And it's just been a great honor to, to get to know some of you guys. Uh, I just uh, want to talk to you a little bit about following dreams. I know Mike kind of alluded to it the other night, but I have a similar story in that respect. Um, I played junior A in the BCHL for four years. And, you know, had a great time. And I got kind of recruited out of uh, a business atmosphere to come work for a company. And that company um, is quite a, a prestigious company. I see its logo on a number of individuals in this room. And that company's Nike. I ended up working for Nike for 18 years and learned a lot of different aspects of business and uh, you know just learning about management materials and uh, you know just education. And, and, and from that aspect. It really helped me develop into following passions, and you know I've always been passionate about this game. I've always been passionate about the coaching aspect, about the teaching, the, just the knowledge of the game. So after 18 years of being in the corporate world, I decided that you know enough was enough. It was a great company. It educated me. It allowed me to see a lot of great opportunities. I said that you know I want to find follow my second dream, and my second dream was to get involved again in this game. And uh, I've been very fortunate, uh, you know, developed a lot of great relationships and a lot of, you know, really good information sources. And, and for, from that aspect, I think that's very important. I think that, you know, if you can't achieve your goal as a player, you can achieve your goal in many other ways. And uh, I know Mike alluded to it at uh, great length the other night, but it's true. It does happen. You can do a lot of different things. As a player, um, you know, there's a couple things that you know I would like to just point out. I think that you know, the harder you work, you're always going to get noticed. And I know that you know through our, our uh, program in the Western Hockey League, you know, a lot of guys get kind of upset when they don't get drafted as a band. And, and you know, I'll tell you one thing: we'll probably end up listing more players than you will draft. So, I mean, there's no end in sight, and there's great opportunities. It's not the Western League, it's the BCHL, the Saskatchewan League, the Alberta League. All these great opportunities for young players to work and hone their game and take it to the next level. And if hockey doesn't 
end up being, you know, the playing side of it for you. There's coaching, you know, there's educational improvements. There's all kinds of great things that you can do in this game. So uh, I congratulate you guys for being here this week. I think this is, you're showing what you want to do. And uh, I think you're going to achieve your dreams in the game at whatever level you want to do. So uh, thanks for having me here tonight. And, uh, you know, for yourselves, uh, I look forward to watching you guys uh, continue your growth and development in the game over the next few years. So, thanks. Thanks, Scott. Okay, guys. Um, yeah, I've been at this camp now, I think four or five years, and it's kind of, and that's the same length of time that I coached. I think the first year I came up was probably following my first season. So for me, this camp has been uh, kind of a really big part of developing me as a coach, and, and uh, as the players, I'm sure it's the same. And, and my sort of, I don't like the word philosophy, but my you know, my style of, of coaching, I think, is to try to find the best people I can and try to go work for them. And, and that's what I've sort of done here with, uh, with the prep camp and why I like to keep coming back. And that's what I've been able to do with uh, the Junior B teams I was a part of and, and now with, um, with Paul River and the BCHL. Um, you know, I just try to find the programs that, that I feel represent what I think the game should be about and I try to go be a part of those. And, as a player, you guys probably aren't much different. Uh, you're all trying to find places to play. As you get older, you have more options. Like in minor hockey, you're pretty restricted as to what you can do. Once you get 15, 16, 17, you can start making those decisions. And, you know, I know a lot of the questions I get from you guys through the league is, what's this league about? What's this team about? And, and you know, I, the way I look at it is, is um, one league's not necessarily better than the other. There's always a fit. There's probably something for everybody. Um, my year in Junior A this year, I didn't have any more fun than I had in Junior B. You know, and a lot of the kids that play four years of Junior B hockey, absolutely love it, go on to university, go on to different things, they go on to college hockey, and they absolutely love it. And their experience in Junior B might be better than the guy that played Junior A. So it's not always sort of like the bigger is better. You gotta find what's right for you. And you know, there's a lot of ways you can find out about those programs. I think the best thing to do is talk to players that have been part of them. Uh, Dylan Sahara was part of our organization last year as an affiliate player. Uh, got to spend a little time on the road with us. He's come to our camp. He's going to come to our main camp this year. You know, so you, you talk to guys that have been a part of it, I think, is a big thing. Because coaches tend to tell you, you know, what you want to hear. And the, the kids don't lie. So I suggest finding guys I've talked to. Um, people in those programs. You can go on the internet, most leagues now, you can find out every transaction the team's made. So if you want to play for, uh, you know, a, a certain team, you can go on there and say, how many trades did these guys make last year? You know, in some teams there's going to be a big zero. Like we did, we've made two trades this summer. I don't think we made a single one during the season last year, and I don't think we made a single one the year before, before I was there. So if you like a stable program, well then we're a good one for you. You know, and if, if it's, that's not important to you, well, then it doesn't matter. But you can find out a lot about the program from people outside of the actual coach. I think it's an important way to do it. Um, and if you guys have, you know, as we go here, questions about sort of how we operate, I'll sort of leave that up to the questions to, to sort of give you what our league's like. Um, the majority of guys in our league are trying to get to the American college system. And a lot of them do, and, and a lot of them don't. You know, it's not an easy route. Uh, you have to be a pretty good player to go that way. But like I said, there's probably something out there for everybody. And it's up to you guys to sort of find out what that is. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say after you fall? I want to come over to that side of the table and start asking questions of these guys. Sure enough. What a, Put your what, hand up. What a wealth of knowledge that uh, we're, we're dealing with here in some tremendous individuals who have devoted their time to factor in your development. And uh, when you hear the words passion, um, dedication, and I'm sure you've heard all the different words, but there's no better learning tool than the people you surround yourself with. And there is no situation that isn't going to provide to you guys some sort of learning. Uh, something you're going to take with you later on. And I, and I guess the, the message that, that I've learned or that I get from this is 
reading books, going to seminars, uh, talking to you guys as players. Believe it or not, a lot of my own personal knowledge and the philosophies that that uh, I've kind of read into myself have come from players in your situation. We've all been that player as well. And you never stop learning, do you? Right? It's amazing what you can pick up, when you pick up, if you pay attention to the details. And uh, a camp like this, um, you know, and Grant, Grant said it best, congratulations, you guys. It's amazing that you've committed that to yourself and you're already here and you're paying that kind of attention to your own personal development. And here's the kicker for this. You're all here as hockey players, but for the last week or two weeks or three weeks or however long you've been here, you've all developed life skills. And, and Grant and, and Coach Ed and, and uh, anybody else that's been here, Coach Grimwood, uh, Coach Johnston, all these guys, your ownership group, they're all here to factor into your life skills. And I haven't met a bad person at this camp yet. I haven't met a person that hasn't helped our development. Um, and, and I think uh, from my own personal experiences, it, it's just a congratulations and a pat on the back for, for all of you for being here. So I think what I do best is I, I get to talk about certain topics. And if you throw something my way, maybe, hopefully, uh, I can help you with regards to your own personal development. Like uh, Coach said, Coach Grimman said, there, there's a program out there that has your name written all over it. It might not be hockey, right? But certainly hockey and anything you do is going to develop you as a person and help you get back up if you've been knocked down. And perseverance is a big part of life and it's a big part of this game. Um, isn't it funny how when you talk to a lot of different people, the successes they've had, it's amazing what you can learn from, from people that have been knocked down and how they respond to that adversity. I think a lot of you are going to be challenged uh, now. Maybe you've been challenged. And I think when, when we talk about character and about what you look for in a program, a lot of that has to deal with how you picked yourself back up and how you faced that challenge head on. Um, my biggest supporter is my wife. I, I think if, if my wife wasn't by my side, I wouldn't have gotten back up every time I got knocked down. So you need people to help. And I think the, one of the most important characteristics on top of that perseverance is, is to find a good support cast, lean on them, because that's what good people do. They lean on people for help. And, you know, again, congratulations for being here and, and taking the time to further your development as people and as hockey players. Okay, so that's the easy part. Thanks very much, guys. What we wanted to do is give you a little bit of a flavor of who these guys are, just to, just to get a sense of their backgrounds. So we'll just throw some questions out, and then you guys can, can jump in a second. What, what obvious thing that, question I get asked a lot is, what is the difference in junior hockey, the style of play, if you're in the Saskatchewan Junior League, Alberta, BC, is there a difference style of play? Is there one kind of player that they favor when they're looking for players in older league, younger league, developmental? Um, I'm just going to throw that out to the group. Who would like to address that? Well, I, I could start. I think, you know, uh, uh, Coach Kevin at the end said it's a lot about life experiences, what you experience. And for us, coming out of Saskatchewan League, we were provincial champs and we played BC in the final and uh, we couldn't contain their speed and, and, the, and the skill or the, at, at the tempo that they did plays at. We, in Saskatchewan League, and I don't know, you got Jeff up there, it's a little bit more, I wouldn't say, what I think you can maybe say it's structured, but we usually go with three or four solid lines and they're all, all kind of the same player. We don't have the real, Terrace. yeah, the tourist type player in our Saskatchewan League. Uh, and, and you got a great guy, a defenseman up there, right? There was few explosive, but I think the difference is uh, between Saskatchewan and BC. I never had the opportunity of playing Alberta. We do play Manitoba in the Anavet Cup. I think Manitoba is a little bit similar to our style in Saskatchewan, but maybe Alberta and BC have a little higher end player. Kevin, you were in Alberta for a little bit. Any comparison? You're also in the BC Junior League. Yeah, yeah. Um, getting a little bit of all worlds here. Uh, I, I agree. I agree 100. percent I think the the play changes. Um, a lot of it has to, and this is, again, this is just opinions, you guys, uh, based on uh, personal experiences. What you have, 
and I'm talking from an economic standpoint, what you have in BC is a lot of privately owned hockey clubs, okay, and versus in Saskatchewan, uh, I think there's only one team that might be privately owned, all the rest, all the rest are, are governed by a board of directors that are basically community owned, non-for-profit organizations. Now this stuff's not going to make any sense to you guys really, but it certainly changes the outlook of the hockey team and every hockey team brings with it different expectations. Um, I'm currently speaking with a team whose expectations are so different than the expectations of a team in the BCHL and I really think and feel that those expectations dictate a lot on the performance value of that specific hockey team. Um, and, and it's pressure, you guys. It's no different pressure for you when you're going to a hockey camp to try and make that hockey team. There's pressure put on organizations from a sustainability perspective, uh, put on coaches from a winning percentage uh, perspective. And at the end of the day, uh, you're looking for people that carry success, that bring success, that promote success. And every organization has a different definition for that word. Um, and that's up to you to research. I, Coach Gurman talked about it a lot, but the biggest difference I see is, and it's starting to move to a trend in Alberta where it's, it's half and half. Um, and, and is there a better one? I don't think so. Uh, championship teams are, are made within that dressing room. You know, the Humboldt Broncos uh, carried on two back, to, was it back to back they won? They went back to back championships. Vernon Vipers have had success recently. Uh, Manitoba is getting stronger year after year. Um, their, you know, their competition. I know the uh, the thought out there was maybe it wasn't a strong league. Well, guess what? It's getting better. And and I think teams really thrive on success based on their definition of what success is. And not every team's success or definition of, of success means win the World Bank Cup. Some teams' definition of success is how well they promote their players and get their players to the next level. Maybe it's to remain sustainable and make the playoffs. After that, everything's a bonus. And that information is there for you to grab. You, you can find that information if you want it. You just have to dig. And you have to ask questions. You need to ask questions. Okay, Jeff, you were in uh, Paul River last year. What, what's a player... What's a weekday player's life like when you're playing in the BC Junior League? Well, our team is, um, you know, last year we had a couple high school kids. This year we're going to have more. So our team is made up of probably about five or six high school age kids. And then the rest of the team are 18, 19, 20. So, you know, college age. So our guys, our high school kids are in school full time. Uh, well, three or four, they have a spare. So they're taking basically a full load at, at high school. Our college age kids have to be in school. Uh, there's a small college up there, and it might only be a course, but they're going to be doing something academic. So our practice schedule through the week actually changes every day, depending on the spare block at school. Now, we're such a small town that the school is literally three minutes from the hockey rink. So on Mondays, we practice at 2 p.m. Tuesdays, it's 9 a.m. Wednesdays, it's noon and Thursdays it's back in the morning again. So that, that schedule is dictated by the high school spare block, right? So they're all on the same spare. So it moves around and it backs onto their lunch hour or the start of the day so that they can always attend practice without having to miss a class. And usually the college is, is pretty well structured around that too. So for our guys, um, you know, a typical day would just be, you know, obviously their school is important. So the high school kids are there longer than the college kids. Uh, the college kids will probably go to their class, come to the rink, maybe get a workout in. Uh, we have a, a, a great gym in our facility. It's not ours personally, it, we share it with the, the community, but the guys have full access to that. So a typical day for our guys is school, gym, and the gym isn't structured in the sense that it's not like this is our workout time. They just have a program to follow and they have to make sure that they get in. If they like to work out eight in the morning, they can do it. If they want to come in at night, they can do it. So it's kind of up to the guy. Um, we give our guys a lot of leeway in that. Like we don't structure them too much during the day, but they are busy. Um, our practices are generally an hour 10. They're not two hours. They're pretty short. They're pretty hard. Um, 
and then on top of that, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we always have minor hockey activities. So our guys are pretty involved with coaching the minor hockey groups and power skating lessons and stuff like that. And then a lot in the community. So that's sort of our week is, is hockey and school. Uh, the guys are busy, you know, but it's, it's you know, never more than they can handle as long as they're organized. And then travel wise, uh, you know, typically if, we, we, uh, if we're at home, we'll have two home games. Or we might go on sort of a Friday, Saturday, a Thursday, Friday, Saturday road trip and come back on Sunday. So that's sort of how we operate. Um, what happens if you miss a class or a day at school because of travel? What do they face? Uh? Okay, well, like I said, for, for practice, you're never going to miss practice, or you're never going to miss class for practice. And that's a nice thing that they've set up there. So in general, you're not going to miss a lot of classes during the week. You're going to miss you know, a significant number of Fridays, I'd say, I don't know what the number would be, but maybe 15 through the year. So you're gonna miss about 15 to 20 school days a year. Uh, we leave it up to the player to be organized with his teachers and with his guidance counselors to plan for that. So if you're missing school on Friday, you know, you better be in there on Monday saying, okay, I'm gonna miss a day. What do I need to do during the week or what do I need to do on the road? Uh, the way schools are going now, there's a lot of online access for courses. So our high school kids, yeah, they're in the hotel rooms and they, they tend to, um, you know, be able to do their homework there. Now, what part of my job was I was in charge of the high school kids and for their education last year. So I was pretty involved and the majority of our guys were pretty organized and they were good students and they did a real good job. And then we had one kid that wasn't and he was missing a lot of classes, sort of unknown to us. And it, Finally, you know, we were, we were told by the school and we were caught up to it. So I had to go down to the school and have a meeting with the principal. And I felt this is what my parents must have felt like when the principal's sitting there saying, he's missing class, he's not doing his homework, he's on Facebook, he's talking to girls and that sort of thing. So with us, if you're slipping up in school, it gets back to us real quick. The counselors and the teachers are usually season ticket holders or volunteers. It's a pretty small world up there. So... There's not a lot of room to slip in school, and, and the moment you do, um, I think that player came out of the lineup for four games over two weeks until he was caught up, and that's pretty significant, and I don't know if there's a lot of coaches that would do that, um, but if you're in school with us, you have to do well. Okay. Can I just jump to Grant? Would you be able to speak to Portland's situation, of Western Hockey League, high school age kids? Um, how does school work there? Is it similar? Is it different? Yeah, it's, it's quite similar. Um, and uh, the only thing is travel becomes much more of a, uh, a point in our league because obviously the, the, the amount of travel the teams have to do to compete every single night. Our schedule isn't built around weekends as much too. So um, the kids in our program are committed to school. And as Mike said the other night, I mean, even the – uh, college age players or kids that are uh, you know on they have to take a college uh, course it's it's part of what uh, the organizations put forward to their players and at the same time the kids that are in high school I mean you know I heard on many occasions the boss would roll in at uh, 4 35 o'clock in the morning and the kids had to be school at school for eight o'clock and yeah it was a sleepy time I'm sure for them but they've made that commitment and uh, you know, they all want to be good, they all want to be pros, and uh, they're committed to the whole process as well. So, um, as an organization, I know Mike takes tremendous pride in the fact that school is a huge component for our club. And, uh, you know, I think one of the awards that we would love to win is the Scholastic Team of the Year. And I know that that's something that uh, we haven't accomplished yet in our short time with the team, but I know Mike is really going after that and wants to make that happen. So. Um, there's no sloughing off. I mean, it's not an easy way just for playing hockey. You get out of school, you got to make it, uh, uh, you know, every effort to be there. The other thing we have is an education advisor who is very much on top of the players and at times will travel with the team if needed be and make sure that the players are up on their studies. So um, a lot of it's done by correspondence, obviously, and we have the luxury. Uh, of a bus that has internet service on it. So, you know, there's no excuses. You, you can do your work and get it done and get it presented back to the schools on time. So, 
Um, it's important. Yeah. To Eddie or Kevin, whoever wants to grab it, um, would a guy who's trying to figure out what to do, would he be better off playing at the, let's say he's a forward, on the 10th to 12th forward on a junior A team, or a top six on a junior B team if he's 16, 17 years old? 16, 17 year old, <coughs> getting heavily recruited by junior B, might be able to crack a junior A, any thoughts? I know it's individual, but if I'm putting you on the spot, would you, what would you tell someone who asked you that question? Want me to go first? Sure. I think it depends the level you're playing. I was afraid and, you'd say that. And, uh, well, it's, it's, it's true. And it depends the, the philosophies and, and the outlook of, of the program you're dealing with. It, it's a loaded question that you have to ask the organizations before you make that decision and you have to decide as players what's important to you because there's other aspects of it of that program if, uh, and I'll, I'll use the Western League as an example um, I was fortunate enough to be a part of Team Pacific three yeah two years ago and one of our biggest challenges as a staff was we would go to watch players and it was the year Ryan Nugent Hopkins and, and uh, I'll use him as an example and then uh, Nathan Burns is another example. Well, it was easy to go watch Ryan Nugent Hopkins because he played probably every second shift and was a go-to guy for the Red Deer Rebels. But when we wanted to go to watch other players, they were healthy scratched or they got two shifts in the whole hockey game. And we had to make decisions on what players to bring to a competition, an international competition. Now, does that mean that hurt one player's development or the other? Well, that's an opinion question. Certainly, Ryan Nugent Hopkins earned recognition being the first overall draft pick. However, Burns got quality coaching and quality development in a program that is one of the most successful programs in, in the nation, right? Uh, with, with great people on board teaching and paving the way for those kids. So, Everybody's development curve comes at us as a, a unique time. Um, and it comes down to philosophy. If, if playing is important to you, then that's what you gotta go after. You gotta make sure you're finding a program that's gonna provide that. And that means making the sacrifice to play at a lower level and be on the ice park. Why not? Why not? Uh, things can go wrong. You can lose hope, you can lose uh, confidence in a hurry. So you have to look in the mirror and, and know what you're looking for in a hockey team and what you're willing to sacrifice when you go to those programs. Any, any opinion on that? Yeah, I, I think it really falls on the player, especially if you have that extra year of uh, uh, AAA midget in, a, in our province in Saskatchewan. Uh, I just tried to keep it as a win-win situation. Uh, if he was up with the junior A team, we, we have definite uh, strong communication between the player, the parent, and, the, and myself. Uh, and use drop-down dates, right? Uh, every two weeks, how's it going? You still have the option to go back to AAA midget. And, and kind of left it in the player's hands. It really showed them the different options. Like in, in, our, in our province, uh, if you know, there's a real strong AAA midget program in Saskatchewan where there's real good coaches and real good organizations. Most of those programs are run just like junior teams. So there was, either way the player was gonna win and you gotta keep that little bit, you know, that philosophy in the players or that option in the player's hand to make the decision for what he wants. And you know, and then you determine whether you want that extra ice time or do you wanna chase that better player? And that's how we kind of left that situation. Your comparison of playing a lot in junior B and a bit in Junior A or the Western League, for a lot of these guys could be similar to playing a lot on the A2 or the B team in the association or, or playing a bit on the A1. Would you guys agree or disagree that it's okay sometimes to be the best player and get that development rather than always thinking that you need to be sort of bottom of the rung and, and always chasing everybody? I think Kevin put it perfectly. I think you play better when you have confidence. And if you're not getting in the lineup every night, it wrecks your confidence. You don't feel good at times. You gotta play. So I, I'm 
an absolute proponent to play where you play. You get an opportunity to you know, compete at the highest level, that's great, but you got to be confident as a player. So find the right place. And I, I still believe that you got to find the right coaching uh, program for you, a program that's going to develop you, um, you know, give you the opportunities. And if you, if you find that, that's where you should play. It's, it's interesting. There's examples both ways as well. Uh, Ed, is it Ed Jovanovski didn't start playing until he was 14, 13 or 14 years old, right? Um, I look back at my development stage when I was playing. Um, I never played rep hockey until my last year at Midget AAA, and I just decided, well, let's let's give this a shot and see what happens. But I played Midget D, like house league hockey, up until Midget because it was fun. I just, I love the game. I love being on the ice. We had 10 players. You know what? It, it may be the player I was and made it easier for me personally to make the AAA team, to play junior A, to play college. It's, it, it made the difference for me. So. What was your path, Kevin? I don't know if we went over that. Your playing path. Playing path? Yeah. Uh, well, played midget hockey in a, in a community that was thousand people um, right up until I was 17 years old on the advice of somebody who said well come to Medicine Hat and give this a try you'll be surprised what happens so I did that made the hockey team uh, started getting letters from the Regina Pats the Medicine Hat Tigers uh, at the time I didn't have a clue what the heck was happening my parents don't know a thing about hockey. They just kind of ship me out the ports and have fun some. And uh, got recruited to a couple of junior A programs. I chose Fort McMurray. Um, and I chose Fort McMurray for a reason because it felt like I was at home. If that's kind of weird because Fort McMurray is way up north and really cold and crazy, but the people I met there made me feel like I was at home and it felt right. So I played there. Won a championship, uh, got a job, and chose to, chose to keep going and working hard. Just the one thing I'll add quickly here, guys, is I think there's a lot of value in being in a, like a leadership role on your team. So if, say you're a grade 12 player, and you can be on the fourth line of a BCHL team or a Westerling team or whatever, versus being, say, the captain of a good midget AAA program or a major midget, like I think there's a lot of value in going through that process of being sort of the top guy on the team, being a big fish. Okay, so a lot of kids are always eager to jump up, jump up, and it's like, you know what, if you haven't gone through that process of being sort of one of the better players on the team, I think there's value in that. And the one thing I tell kids is when we're recruiting them is, if you're gonna play for our team, we're getting you ready to play college hockey. We're not getting you ready to be good enough to play for our team. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Like, if you're with us, you're, you're from day one, you're able to contribute, right? If you can't come and step into our lineup and be a player and play a regular shift, and if you can't handle that or if we don't have faith in you to do that, you probably shouldn't be there. So if you're ready to go on to a team as a really strong contributing member, hey, go for it. But if it's going to be a scrap just to be on that team or just a scrap to – you know, to get ice time, well then, you know, and you still have midget time left or junior B time left, you know, I think there's probably value in, in maybe I taking that year of midget, being a captain, playing a, in a leadership role. So I think if you can be a good, solid, contributing player, go for it. And if you're not there, take another year. Jeff, tell me, you told me the other night, how many 19-year-olds, how many first year and what age were they rookies? Yeah, I'm getting it wrong, but it's quite well, interesting. Yeah, our team, and, and I don't know if we're different than other junior A teams because of um, we don't we don't have a lot of uh, hunters here. Who's hunter? Hunter from Culver. Hunter. Not here. We have we have a Culver kid here, so I don't. <laughs> we don't have a lot of strong minor hockey kids coming through because we're such a small town. So we have to really work hard to recruit. You know, we have a lot of BC kids, but we go everywhere. Um, I think the difference between our league and say the Western League is the Western League, you're finding a lot of kids at 14, 15, 16 that are just exceptional athletes and they're great players and they're ready and they can handle it and they're smart kids. 
and they go and do it. Now there's those kids in our league as well, but what our league's good for is if you're a kid that maybe at 16, 17, you're not quite ready, uh, you've got till you're 20 years old. We're not getting you ready for a draft. We're getting you ready to go to college at any time. It might be until you're 21. So our team last year had five 19-year-old rookies that didn't make Junior A as an 18-year-old and played Junior B. So we had five. This year, out of our incoming guys, and we don't quite know our roster yet, but we'll probably have at least two, so not as many as last year, but two kids, one coming out of Junior B in Victoria, and one coming out of a prep school program back east. So, you know, for, for us, and, and the kids that came in as 19-year-old rookies last year, they were some of our best players. Like they stepped in and surpassed some of the kids that have been part of our program for a year or two. So maybe that shows that we need to do a better job. You know, so I don't think there's a time limit on a good player. And I think you're seeing that in the NHL now. I think you're seeing a lot of guys come in at 24, 25. Like not everyone's going to be a Steven Stamkos. You know, and the majority of us probably aren't. So um, for our team, I don't care if a kid's 16, 17, 19, if it's a 20-year-old rookie out of junior B and we really like a kid, like I would take him. That wouldn't bother me at all. So if you're a kid that's a so-called late developer, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I think that's a, a feature of, of the Tier 2 leagues that are really good, is if you're a 19-year-old that hasn't been discovered yet, well, hey, you can still come play two years in our league and still probably accomplish your goals. So. That's something I, and, and you know, in a sense, and I think we all, and you're a scout yourself, so I think we all like to find those kids that have been overlooked, and that's a really fun part of what we do, is finding kids that no one else knows about, that maybe we see something in and they can make the team, and I'll, I'll quickly tell you a story about a kid in our spring camp, uh, 19 year old from way up north, really, uh, came to our spring, he rode every team in the BCHL, and asking for a spring camp invite and he told us we were the only one to write him back. So he came in and this kid's been playing senior hockey for the last two years uh, in some industrial league way up north and he came in and like we love this kid right away. And when we're doing our depth chart we've got our guys, you know, our returning guys, our recruited guys, guys are going to come in and try out and you know, we kind of have one through 20 forwards, right? All the guys that could potentially play for our team. And this kid's about number 18. Okay, so how many forwards do you take on a team? We'll take 12 or 13. This kid's slotted at 18 right now. And so is he going to make our team? What do you think? No. You know what? Probably not until we sat down and I said to my head coach, I said, you know what, though? He's number 18 right now, but I don't think you have the guts to cut this kid. <laughs> Because he's going to come in and he's going to take someone's job. I guarantee it. And he's about number 18, but I know he's going to come in and make our team because he's just going to work and he's going to want it. And he hasn't played in good programs. He hasn't got exposure. He doesn't come to camps like this because he doesn't have the money to do it. But this kid, you know, I guarantee you will make our team because he's just going to, he's going to will it to happen. So if you want to make teams, you know, don't worry so much about where you've played, where your other guys have played, how many spots are open, how many of this. Go in there and take your spot. And I think you got to have that mentality, and if you do, it's going to serve you well. Grant, just uh, my last question, then you guys can fire away. Um, Grant, you head scout for Portland. You obviously you've been very successful. We talked about that this week. I think there's, if I remember right, there's four big things that you're looking at in the player. Yep. From your organization, I know there's lots of skills, but you guys prioritize for them. Just want to touch on what those four are, because I think it's a bit of an eye opener when I heard it. Yeah, I know we. I mean, we, the nice thing is, that in, as an organization, we built a model what type of player we're looking for, and when we go out and look at uh, events where we're scouting, we talk about you know characteristics of a player, and when it comes to the actual player himself, we look for number of different things. Number one for us is obviously skating. Skating is an important part of our program because that's the way we want to play. We want to be a high tempo team that uh, you know has the ability to get the puck up the ice in lot, with lots of speed. Number two for us is hockey sense. 
And I mean, that's something we measure a lot of things off of, but uh, it's a really strong component of our organization. We want smart individuals. We want guys that can read and react to certain situations and be involved in uh, challenges and they adapt to them very quickly. The other one is compete. And to me, compete is a huge component of the whole picture. Um, we want our players to be able to compete in every type of situation and do it honestly every single time. And then the other part of it is just, you know, puck control senses or things that you do with the puck. And, you know, if you got a good skill package, we like to see that and we like to notice that. I mean, those are four things that we measure off of. One of the other things that I'm really proud of as an organization that we do is we actually, during uh, the Bantam situation, we'll send out um, questionnaires to coaches, parents, and the players, just kind of giving out uh, information about our program, but asking them very pointed questions. And it reveals a lot of information to us, but at the same time, that's great information that we gather, but we're in the rink so much and we talk to a lot of different individuals, we talk to coaches constantly, and they're the ones that are telling us about the off-ice behaviors of players, um, you know, the characteristics, uh, are they good teammates, those types of things. And that all comes together uh, for us when we get together for our draft meetings and we start to build our platform. And then using those criteria, we start to put our program together. And, you know, hopefully we're going to continue to be successful and, uh, you know, we're going to stay uh, away with our program. I mean, the model's built, we're just following and executing off it. It uh, seems to be working okay right now. So. Guys, any questions? Just fire away. Um, this is a question for all of you, but um, what's your favorite type of player? Uh, great question. You, buddy. You want to start? <laughs> <laughs> I think you just heard four things right there. I like a player that just comes, is on time, starting with that, and works hard throughout practice. And, uh, you know, it's just a good all-around good guy. I would agree 100%. I mean, and I'm going to wear two hats here, but in the Junior B situation that we kind of took over late, um, we're starting to try to build a character and trying to create a culture. And that's what I want to build a team around, is good character, good culture, and uh, kids that want to learn. And if, if you want to learn, I think that the envelope opens up and everything comes really easy for you and uh, that's the kind of player that I want to have on my hockey club for sure. Um, I'm going to give a couple answers because I like to talk. So, um, <laughs> You know, one thing uh, I, I guess you could say is, you know, if, if I had to put in a nutshell, what, what we're looking for is we're looking for the most, most highly skilled player in the grittiest hard work and package. Does that make sense? Like we're looking for a guy with high skill, but works. Okay, and that's, so that's sort of what we're looking for. Um, the other thing I'll say is, the other guys we're looking for, like I, I assume a good player is someone that's good at what he does. So I can find a player that scores 30 goals, but I can also find a fourth liner that might score five goals, but he's a great leader, he's got great character, he's a penalty killer, he's a good energy guy, all those things. I look at him as just a good a player, it's just a different role. So don't be afraid to be just good at what you're good at. And if you're, you know, hey, if you're not a goal scorer, don't worry about it. Be the best defensive defenseman you are, or whatever your strengths are, play to that. And then the other thing is, I think most guys, you know, we have players that we tend to like, but you know what, quality is quality. And um, our, our defense core this year was, you know, pretty good. And our guys were 6'5", 6'4", 6'4", 6'3", 6'2". That was the size of our first five defense. So these guys are massive. All right? And we had a very good team. The year before, and I wasn't there, uh, the D core was 5'9", 5'7", 5'8", 5'11". And that team lost in a game seven of a final as well. So you had two very good teams with the same coach, same philosophy, and totally different players one year to the next because that's what was there this year and he liked those guys. So don't worry about what you're not. Just worry about being a quality version of what you are and I think coaches will find that. Kevin, anything? Well, I mean, all of those uh, characteristics are, are common nature and a lot of the programs that you see, but 
a couple of other things that that I would touch on and add to that would be courage and camaraderie. Uh, courage being the type of player that, like I said earlier, gets back up when he's knocked down. Uh, to me, that's a player that plays a big game. Um, a player that's willing to to put himself in an area of the ice uh, to benefit the team um, and make that sacrifice. And that, that's where that camaraderie factor really plays a role in the hockey team. Uh, how often have you heard, well, man, did we have a great hockey team, but we didn't get along. And we lost in the first round of the playoffs. I mean, I've coached teams uh, that have been in that situation. And I think, you know, you, you could be the best player in the league, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're the best player for, for our program. You gotta fit in with the group and you gotta be aligned with the values of the hockey team. Can I throw one thing on that? Um, the one thing I'll say though, just quickly, is we had a, an email sent to us last year from a, a, a junior beat coach and he told us about a kid and it was just, this kid's an outstanding leader, this kid's great in the community, he's 17, I wish I made him nice captain, he's my hardest working guy, there's da 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 And then at the end of the email, it was kind of like, and he's also, hey, he's fast and he's this and he's that. So 99% of it was just about his character and his personality. And then there was one little mention about, you know, by the way, he's a good player too. So at the end of the day, there's lots of good hockey players out there, but I think most guys, I mean, Portland and, and Ed and, and, and Kevin, I think we're all looking for good guys. Okay, I think we're all looking for good guys. So we AP'd that player without ever seeing him play. And, and that was 99% just on his personality and, and his character and those types of things. So don't underestimate what that's going to you know, do for you. Okay. Chris, I think you had a question. Oh, yeah. uh, what's, what kind of advice can you guys give to like a player that just got cut from a team and maybe talk just a little bit about perseverance and stuff, okay. something like that? Good question. I, uh, I think the, it comes down to, to personal belief. And a lot of the message that, that I would deliver to players that I was fortunate enough to evaluate was um, – taking a good look in the mirror and believing in yourself. Uh, again, my biggest hero is my, my wife. And I think any day that becomes a struggle for, for anybody, uh, she's an RN and she sees people uh, every day that go through uh, terrible things. Um, but she believes. And I think the, the constant reminder and the positive affirmations that you give to yourself are gonna be the most powerful. If you need somebody else to, to pick you up every day, you're probably not uh, as strong as you need to be. You've got to be able to pick yourself up every once in a while, but um, yeah, I, I think it makes you stronger. And if you put that belief in your own mind that when something bad goes, you know, not your way or something doesn't go your way, uh, just keep believing. You never know what will happen, right? And you're how, many, how many players in this room have got cut before? Absolutely. We all have, right? That's just one thing to recognize. Eddie? I think if I can speak to that right now, what the hockey community does, you create yourself a network, and along with that becomes a support group. And I think it's really important that for whatever field you go in, you get the support of your peers. For you guys, you didn't have to be here the last X amount of days. You guys ran 400 meters together. You ran the miles together. <clears throat> you didn't have to do it, but you did. So if it does happen, and it will happen to some of you guys this year that you get cut, you have a support group right in here. You have great coaches. You've met great friends. And it's going to happen, right? How many guys? There's going to be a percentage of kids in this room that are going to get cut from their teams. And that doesn't make you a bad player. Because the guys that pushed you to get through the 400 meter, the mile, you know, the extra stuff from the ice, living in these dorms, you chose to do that, so you've created yourself your own little support group. So if it does happen, don't be scared to talk to your friends in this room, because they are your friends now. For me, personally, I was fired a year and a half ago, and within a half an hour of getting fired, I had emails or text messages from my fellow coaches in my league, which, at the end of the day, like uh, Coach Kevin said, I don't, maybe didn't need it because I'm a pretty strong person, but it did feel good. So if it does happen to your buddy, say, listen, we, we, we pushed ourselves through the 400. 
get up. So you're creating yourself an own, your own little environment here that'll help you get through some tough times. It's important, and family is probably the most important thing, but now you've created an outer family or a little bit of a support group. And remind yourself that, uh, I like to encourage players to think of it this way. When you're, when you're in the preseason, when you're in the tryout, when you're in those practices, when you're in, you made the team and you're early in the year, you're playing in front of the whole league, right? So you're creating options for yourself depending on that impression that you make. So you might go through the preseason and play fantastic, but you're the wrong fit for that team. But if you have played well, you're going to create other opportunities. And at the same time, while you're going through that, keep your eyes and ears open. What are the, what are the organizations that impress you? How do you like the way they play? The discipline of their players? What's going on? Talk to different people. So along the way, you know, be your own player agent. Right? Identify what you like and you don't like, and you'll know exactly the first <coughs> phone call you want to make if you're ever in that situation. It's, it's funny that uh, you talk about that. And <clears throat> just being here, uh, I sat down and talked with, with Coach Grimwood and his experiences in Junior B, and I'm sorry to, to, to no, tell a story about no. you, but, but uh, there was a number of players in a championship caliber season that he was fortunate to be a part of that were cut from <laughs> other programs in the same league that yeah. he gave an opportunity to. and had success immediately so uh, yeah you know what it hurts absolutely no one likes to get fired or, or cut and you're gonna go through that stage of mourning but the Sun comes up the next day and I, I think what we see and, and I I don't know if I speak for, for you guys but we see a lot of kids uh, and a lot of different people in society now that, that give into it give into that pressure and I just don't think, I, I would encourage you not to. If you believe in something and, and you feel that you're capable of doing it, go for it. And, and I know it's, it's something that you hear and, and again, it comes from the successful people and, and all this, but there is truth to it. Um, and the, the, the immediate truth that comes from that is from within. And if you can continue to, to pick yourself up, you will be fine. You know, and anybody can promise that. Okay, question, I, I know at some point we're going to run out of time, so I'm just kind of aware of that. There's a lot to be said about that topic. Any other questions from the group? Fire away. Oh, what do you think your hardest aspect in your coaching experience was, like, fixing a player's, like, physical mentality or, like, his mental, like, mentality? Like, what do you think it was? Like, what was the hardest part? I think that's something that evolves uh, for all of us. We've all faced the challenge of a player that maybe lost his confidence. And I think the, the hardest thing, really, for me, is to look in the mirror and question myself. Um, you know, what did I do that might have been a better fit for that particular player? Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just... <laughs> yeah, there's, 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 there's nothing easy about and there, there's nothing easy about looking at a, a player that you know wants something so bad and telling him that he isn't a part of your program there is nothing easy about it and I know it's uh, it's very difficult on you guys and we sit in there and, and it looks like you know we're full of courage and whatnot but when you walk out that door believe me we're hunched over thinking were the crap of the world as well. Like it's it's not a good feeling to, to go through something like that. But it, it's a it's a team. You have to select that team. You, I believe and, and I hope uh, I can speak on. I know I can speak on that very honest and truth uh, and being straight up. That's the only way you can do it. And I know I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I wasn't. Yeah, when we have to release kids and cut kids, like. Like, I've lost sleep over it. I've been almost sick to my stomach over it. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, you know, that's a, a difficult part of coaching. Um, yeah, that's probably the best answer. So I, think most, I think most coaches probably would agree that addressing a weakness in your being, yet developing some part of your skill set, is something that they're all very comfortable with. 
right? And some of us are better than others in, in moving there. But trying to figure out what's going on in your head is really difficult, right? It takes time. It takes you reaching out to the player, them being willing to share with you. That's a tough one. And so that's where maybe it makes a difference who can connect with players on that side of their game versus um, just the pure technical side, which is your playing skills and what you're doing, what posi you know, what position you're in a given shift and where you should be. And addressing that's easy. Knowing why you're doing something or how you're reacting is really an everyday challenge. I think it's important too that we as coaches communicate on a regular basis with every single player. I think that you, you have to have an open door policy and that you have to know exactly what's going on with the individual. Um, you know, I don't know what's going on in somebody's house unless somebody comes to me and tells me or I go out and ask for it. And uh, it's important that we understand what's going on in uh, your everyday lives because at the end of the day, we're, we become family. And, uh, you know, we have to grow together and develop together. And, you know, if, if we can help you, that's hopefully what our, our best uh, attribute is, is to help the individual player and then allow them to grow, um, you know, as an individual, but, you know, even as important as a hockey player. So keep the communication open. I think when you go back to your club teams, that's the best message I can give you is make sure you talk to your coaches constantly. And it's... It, it, you know, the more the, the more the players talk to us, the better it is. It's difficult when uh, you try and break down the barriers, but um, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to know exactly what you're going on. I'm hopefully speaking for everybody in this room, and I'm sure I am. But uh, make sure that you guys do a really good job of uh, uh, talking about your feelings and talking about what you want out of the program and, and make it known. So, where are you guys most comfortable talking to your coach? What? What environment? <laughs> they dive off. You like knocking on their door, the one that's sitting on the chair and he's across the desk. Is that comfortable? Um, for me, it's not comfortable. Where are you really comfortable? Anyone? <laughs> Texting. Huh? Yeah, you can text their question. That's, that's, I know, honestly, that's become a big one. I don't know. Is it? With Ed? Well, what I was looking yeah. for is are you not more comfortable on the ice? In the flow of a practice, right after, right before, yeah. right? Kind of casual, you and that person in that moment. That'd be my first suggestion of start to make sure that that communication starts to happen, right? Get it off your chest. Don't go home with it. Yeah, Ask the question. Really Look for help. Ice, right? like, What's that? You don't really have time to have a conversation with them on ice, right? You don't? Make time. Why not? Yeah, they will. Yeah. Assistant coaches are are good. You're right. You're you know you're, you're actually right. In a minor hockey situation with limited ice time, yeah, yeah, that's, that's different. Time. In a junior hockey situation with extra ice time, yeah. and you're now practice yeah, is broken easy. down. You have some free time. Yeah. That might be a little. But bit it can also be as quick as just like end of practice. Hey, coach, you got something to talk to you about? And he'll say, Okay, great. You know, come up to my room after. And so you've broken the ice in your comfortable environment. You might have the conversation elsewhere. But at least you've kind of broken the ice, and yeah. and then it's you know then it's probably easy. Um, assistant coaches are usually sometimes the easy guy to talk to, more than the head coach sometimes. Yeah, trainers, trainers. Use your trainer, use your captains. It's important for you guys to communicate how you're feeling. Right? Yeah, it really is. It's, like, yeah, yeah. Really <coughs> Take the time for a couple more questions. Go ahead. Uh, yes, for the junior, junior guys, but um, what kind of scholarships can I have in each different league? And <laughs> Anyone want to start? Um, the scholarship, and that's a great question. We were talking about this last night. Um, the scholarship thing's tricky. It, it's not, first of all, a scholarship is not necessarily, hey, here's four years of school paid for. The reality is most of them are a series of four one year contracts, if you look at it like that. Um, not all scholarships are full rides, okay? So when you hear scholarship, that can mean you're going to Boston University 100% paid for, or it means you can be going to, you know, some state school 50 or 60% paid for. So 
do your homework on that. Like when you're talking to a team, how many scholarships did we have? Oh, we had 15. Okay, well, how many were full rides? Two, five. You know, so that's a good question when you talk to to um, to junior A teams. Um, I don't know what our percentage is off of our roster last year. We probably have nine off the team last year and kids on that team that will probably get one this year. I'd say about 13 or 14 of the 20 kids will get a scholarship. So it's definitely not everybody. And you know, you gotta be a pretty good player to get one. And there is that mentality of like, hey, I played three years of junior A, where's my deal? And it's, that's not the reality. The reality is you have to be a very good player. Uh, the better you are as a student, the more options you have. Like we have a lot of kids come in and um, yeah. as 18 year olds, and then they're like, they're, they're asking, well, what schools can I go to? Why aren't schools talking to me? Well, you're not good enough to get into 70% of these schools academically. And then they say, well, what can I do about it? And they say, nothing, high school's over, buddy. Like it's gone, you know, <laughs> your, your record follows you around. So number one, the better you are as a student, the more options you're gonna have, because it's gonna open more schools up, up for you. Um, the top players usually get something close to a full a full deal, meaning 100% paid for. Uh, but a lot of guys, those deals aren't full rides. And if a coach tells you that they are, the coach is lying to you. Nate, you spent a lot of time in the Eastern U.S. Just talk about the value of you know. There's those blue chip Division One hockey programs, kids getting drafted, going pro, lots of prestige. What about the other one? What about the give free school that no one's heard of. What's the value of that? Why should someone keep playing junior with maybe that as one of their goals? Like, what have you experienced? I talked to Chris Williamson about that a couple of weeks ago, your captain who's going to a Division three school. I know so many guys that ha had a better Division three experience than Division one guys. University of Wisconsin, may carry 15 or 16 forwards. That means there's 25% of them are watching every game. Another 25% of them are getting a couple shifts a game. Guy goes to D3, maybe he's a bigger part of the role. But academically, in New England, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, that area of the Northeast, there are schools that you guys have never heard of, maybe will never hear of, that are top academic private colleges. There's 2,000 people in this beautiful uh, walled-in college on the top of a mountain or in a little town. And the connections that they have coming out of those academic institutions set them up for the rest of their lives. They may play in front of 400 stu uh, fans a game instead of 16,000. It might be a cold rink that's not even as nice as Alberni here. But the connections that they make in their alma mater, being an alumni of Bowdoin College or Middlebury College, will set them up with internships in Boston and New York City and Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. and major cities in the U.S. and tap them into a pipeline of jobs and opportunities that they never would have got otherwise. So you can be a bigger fish on your team you can get a great education. You have class sizes of eight or 10 students and you have to be there. If you miss three classes, you fail. So your teachers know who you are, they care about you. And when I was playing junior in four years, I never considered once that that would be an option because I think my ego. Junior hockey players have an ego that they wanna be the stud, they wanna be at Boston, they wanna be at Wisconsin. Well, we can't all be that kid. And so Division Three was, it seemed like a second-rate choice. And like you guys know, my career went different. It went to Europe, and I went to UVic, and I loved that. Never changed that for a second. But check your ego at the door, and don't worry that you're not going to Michigan or Wisconsin or beat Boston College or Boston University, because the academic and opportunities and are and fantastic. Canadian CIS into them as well, because you've now got great trade school, great technical school. Not all of us are fantastic students. You know, we might want to pursue an apprenticeship, a, a trade in something. There's lots of great hockey playing colleges and universities in Alberta, for instance, where the 
level of play is really high, the top juniors, top Western League, you come out with a two-year diploma or degree, or you go to a school that's recognized in your province, so that when you come out as a professional, people are waiting there to give you a job, and you're working where you think you might end up living. So if I'm from Calgary, I might take a job there and build that, to go to university there and build that network of contacts there. If I want to think I might stay in British Columbia, I might go to a school there, okay? And the level of hockey is all top junior, Western Hockey League, mostly some junior A, some very good players. You might not be good enough to make the team, but nobody knows that, right? Nobody talks about that. But the other side of that academic stuff that doesn't get addressed in a hockey camp is really wonderful opportunity. So if you guys can stay with the game until you're 19 or 20, you'll have opportunities. You'll figure out which one's best, right? Be able to keep developing your game. Because as Nate said, no matter which example we choose, the level of play is really high. And don't let yourself get typecast into things like, I think the mindset 10 years ago was the Western League was for guys that were going to play pro hockey and Junior A was for guys that wanted to go to college. Well, the way it's working is the Western League offers outstanding scholarships for the kids that come out of there and don't go to pro hockey. And a lot of kids in the Tier 2 leagues are finding a way to the NHL. So no matter what route you take, you know, there's going to be great academic options and there's going to be good hockey options. So. You know, I think like we all said, just do your homework and find what's right for you. But no matter which way you go, I don't think it's locking you into any predetermined set. Like Nate says, you know, he came out of Tier 2 and went to Europe and still got his degrees, right? So there's no one way to go. There's no one way to take it. Um, you know, there's, there's every option is going to create different avenues for you. So don't let people sort of typecast you into, into one, one set group. There's a lot of players that I've talked to, and myself included, who aren't like super flashy style players. You know, they're not the guy who's going to make the move from this side of the ring to that side of the ring. They're not going to What would you recommend for them to get noticed? Like, how, how is someone who's not the big game player the whole time going to get noticed? Well, I think you are getting noticed. You know, you'd be surprised. I think that. Uh, you know, there's so many avenue, avenues for you to be played, and you're going to get noticed no matter what you do. I think that uh, there's enough people watching you. I think, but you know, your characteristics, the way you play, are going to determine your fate. And you know, the harder you work, as everybody said, is a characteristic that gets noticed very quickly. And uh, you know, your skill package is obviously a really important part of that. But uh, you know, you just keep persevering through things. I mean. You know, as one door closes, two more open up, and that's the thing that you just always got to believe in. And to, you know, and that, and that you'll door find that closes. Sorry, Grant. Yeah. Just add to that. The door that closes might have a little post-it note on it, and it might be you better develop your skating, yeah. right? Or you might need to have some strength. Yeah. So as that message comes to get where you really want to get to, it might come with some really good feedback because I think you are getting noticed in, in most cases. And you might not have, might have to be very realistic that you're going to have to add to your game to really reach your goals. It's not that people are ignoring you. It might be a message that you're not quite ready. So you can either walk away and give up, or you can address some of those some of that feedback that you're getting. Absolutely. I think most coaches, and I know all, probably us for, like absolutely love gritty, physical players. Like we're looking for that. Just you're always looking for your number one center, but you know you're looking for that element too. And you're not going to have a team full of goal scorers or, or vice versa. So, um, like I said earlier, like be good at what you are. And if you're a banger and a crasher, we'll be the best banger and crasher in the league. And uh, you know there's going to be someone that likes you for that. What I wouldn't mind doing, just given the time, is when we wrap up here, these guys will be available if you want to. You haven't met them or you have a specific question, they're definitely available. They're available tomorrow. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you guys for a couple, sit, couple sitting of here. Yeah, if there's obvious questions, we'll definitely take them. Go ahead. Thanks, Ed.